All right, the I Am Rappaport app is available on all Apple and Android devices. Once the app is downloaded, click the text tab to sign up for premium access. Do not live in FOMO. Premium access unlocks all Wednesday primetime episodes, plus the I Am Rappaport stereo podcast archives. Start the journey with us from the beginning. Here's a few historical moments from the archives. I'll keep saying it until people know. I'm like, one more episode I'll see in my sidekick. So they're like, who the fuck is G Monetti? They're gonna know in a few. I'm in here with my man, Bill Burr. If you're getting your fucking information and any sort of news from me and this fucking guy that I'm in here with, <laughs> you got bigger fucking problems. I'm about to talk to fucking Marty Scorsese about Raging Bull. This is not a test. Hello? Marty, it's Michael Rappaport. Oh, hi, Michael. How are you doing? Terry Crews, you got to shoot that motherfucker. <laughs> you can't fight him. Liam Neeson, I'm ready to go fair one with this motherfucker. <laughs> Download the I Am Rappaport app today. The I Am Rappaport Stereo Podcast World Tour is picking back up this summer. July 26th, me and G. Moody, last name rhymes with duty, will be in Toronto, Ontario at Danforth Music Hall at 8 p.m. We will be back in New York City August 4th at the Gramercy Theater, Saturday, August 18th in Houston, Texas at the Warehouse Live Ballroom, Wednesday, August 22nd in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania at Union Transfer, and Saturday, August 25th in Boston at the Wilbur Theater. The I Am Rappaport Stereo Podcast World Tour is going down this summer. You can get tickets at IamRappaportTour.com. Me, G. Moody, whose last name rhymes with duty, and you know there's going to be special guests along the way. We kick things off July 26th in Toronto, Ontario at Danforth Music Hall 8 p.m. Canada. Here we come. All right, my name is Michael Rappaport. You are now listening to the I Am Rappaport Stereo Podcast. I'm going to be honest. There's been a whirlwind for America's newest hero. It's been nonstop since the action on Flight 1563. Um, so we're going to get right into this. This is a banger. I am Rappaport Stereo Podcast interview with my guy who I worked with on Higher Learning, who I became a fan of when I saw him in Juice co-starring opposite Tupac Shakur. He's had a great career, long, illustrious career. You've seen him in Love and Basketball. Like I mentioned, I saw him first in Juice, Higher Learning, the Wood, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. You can currently see him on USA Network's The Shooter. My man from Brooklyn, Omar Epps, who's now an author. He just wrote a book from fatherless to fatherhood. This guy's an icon, okay? He's been doing it for 20-plus years. Coming up next on the Iron Rappaport Stereo Podcast, my man from Higher Learning, Omar Epps. Let's get right to it. It's summertime, okay? It's barbecue season. You want to have a good barbecue? You got to have good meat, okay? Butcher Box. Butcher Box delivers 100% grass-fed and grass-finished free-range chicken and heritage pork. The fantastic quality of Butcher Box meats starts with the commitment to raising animals humanely and free of antibiotics. Each box comes with at least 9 to 11 pounds of meat, which is enough to serve 24 individual-sized meals. You can choose from five different boxes. All beef, beef and chicken, beef and pork, or mixed pork, or a custom box with such you chooses your own cuts of meat. All the meat is delivered right to your doorstep on dry ice, free shipping anywhere in the continental United States. It's high quality, healthy protein that you can trust. Listen, the 4th of July is right around the corner. You want to have a good barbecue, you got to have good meat. Anyone who joins before July 8th, it's free bacon for life. Free bacon for life. To receive free bacon for life on every order plus $10 off, use the promo code CHAMP10. That's CHAMP10. Go to ButcherBox.com for the best meat 
you'll ever taste in your life. You want to have a good barbecue, you got to have great meats. Go to ButcherBox.com. Test, test, test. Let me get a test, test. One, two, one, two. The baritone stylings of my man Omar Epps. Actor. Icon at this point. I know you're like, what are you talking about? But you're an icon at this point. Author. <laughs> I just finished your book, From Fatherless to Fatherhood, which I yes. want to talk to you about. And it's crazy because this is like the first time I've ever really got to talk to you. And of course, we did Higher Learning. Yeah. Which was 94. And That's when crazy. you think back, like, 94, like, yo. It was a whole other world. It's damn near 25 years ago. That's crazy. 94. We were shooting that shit in 94. And I always remember this. And, and it was so funny. And I want to, like, see what you remember about that movie set. But, like, we were young. We were, like, in our method acted shit. It was, like, you know, racially <laughs> divided set. It was, like, you know, the skinheads. And it was, like, the, you know, it was, like, the black dudes. It was Ice Cube, Buster Rhymes, yeah. you, Regina King. And I'm, like... The fucking skinheads, you know, I'm like, I want to hang out with the cool motherfuckers. Like, these motherfuckers <laughs> are over here chilling. But I never forgot this, and I want to ask you how you got this. I remember we were shooting Higher Learning in early, I think it was like February. I know what you're about to Or ask. January of 94. These are true stories. This is a true story. And, and obviously at the time, you know, there was a lot of anticipation on a young artist named Nas. <laughs> I knew it. He had, he had, he'd actually been in my first film soundtrack, Zebrahead, Halftime. Mm -hmm. He had done Live at the Barbecue. And like at the time, there was, you know, Source Magazine. It was like, yo, he's coming out with this record. He's coming out with this record. And, and, I, and we knew it was like coming out in the spring. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't know the date. Like, I, you know, it wasn't like now the internet, like, you know, like Saturday it's coming out or two. Like, but right. I, you knew it was coming. But I remember one time I'm walking by your trailer and I also remember you were friends with Little Daddy Shane, mm -hmm. who was Big Daddy Kane's brother, and and he had just rhymed on Kane's record. So I was like, "What the fuck? Like this is like." And I was and I was very sick when we were filming Higher Learning because I got really thin. I had like stomach shit. Oh, were yeah. Oh, so but like you know like I, and I was also like you know trying to like stay in my my character in my zone and you know. But you motherfuckers were chilling, and I remember walking by your trail. I distinctly remember walking by your trailer and hearing az on life's a bitch <laughs> and nobody was really fucking me it wasn't like we were like not cool with it, but it was just kind of like we didn't really know each other like you you had a bunch of people with you in the trailer, not a bunch few people mm -hmm. and i go yo what the fuck is that and, you, and like you, somebody was like that's nas that's the illmatic shit and i were like word and like they were like yeah get the fuck out of here remy you know and <laughs> but my question to you is first how did how? you get that tape i mean the statutory limits are fine so yeah. how did you get it and like, what do you remember about? Do you remember like me? I remember. Ex I remember all of this in detail. So, um, one of the fr you know uh, New Deal John Singleton's production company that they had called me up there. You know, we doing fittings or something like that, right? So I went up to the office and um, was my cousin G with me or Shane? One of them was with me. Little Daddy Shane. Yeah, Little Daddy Shane. Who, like, at the time, I was like, oh, because it was the closest thing to Big Daddy Kane. I was like, fucking Shane. Yeah, that's the homie. So I walk by this office, right, and I see a pile of cassettes, right? And I guess it was like they were, you know, listening to stuff for the soundtrack or whatever. And I literally, I walk by this office, and I see a blue cassette, and it said Nas on it. And I was like, yo... So I backtrack and I'm and I think it was either my cousin G or Shane was with me. I said, yo, that's the Nas album. And he was like, what? And I said, they just got this shit sitting on a pile of tapes. Like I felt like it was so disgustingly disrespectful. And so I had to I'm swipe that. Yo, I'm getting this. I'm gonna take care of this. And this was like about I forget when we shot the movie. It was I broke rule number one of the Iron Rap Poor Stereo Podcast and I and I fact checked. I believe that record came out in April. This was it had to be like February or January because yeah, exactly. we knew it was coming, but you didn't hear any of it. You didn't hear it. But you so, just heard a lot of talk and excitement it's about coming. it. It's coming. So I get the cassette. As soon as we get in the whip, leave that. We're listening and we're like, this is the Nas album. And it was the whole record, it right? It was the whole our, our heads exploded. We would I mean, that was rotation for like until the album came out. I just couldn't believe that they had Nas's album, his first album, Illmatic, on a pile of cassettes, like it was just discarded. So I felt, you know, as 
hip hop, our culture, I had to guard this thing. <laughs> and, <laughs> with and, my and listen life. to it to it with it yourself. Yeah. I mean, that was that it was, was amazing. That's and, so hilarious that you remember. I never that. forgot that because it's one of those moments, like you know, certain songs and musical moments. And I remember, like, I mean, as when people probably heard AZ rhyming on it, you it was like, yo, who is voice? And like, and then I remember hearing Nas, but I remember visualizing the realism, and I was yep. like, what the fuck is this shit? And you're like, that's the Nas shit. And you probably knew like you shouldn't have it. You know, it and was, it, it was before the time of bootlegging. Like it was, yeah. it was like bootlegging didn't even happen. Like that shit wasn't even a thought that you would take something like that. There was nowhere to put it out to. Right, there right. There was no internet. There was no like y'all must like it was just. Nah, we roll with that. I, we none of us could believe that they would just have. We were looking at it like, how could you treat it like that? Like, do you not know what this is? Right. Like, if you're listening to, you know, music for a soundtrack, that's fine. But this is separate from that. Yeah, so, that was crazy. So we were like, you know what's funny? What I, I remember that. I remember a lot of things about Higher Learning, but the that was my first earthquake was when we were right. filming Higher Learning. They had just had right. that big earthquake in Los Angeles. Right. And we were on set one day, and I guess it's the, the aftershocks. Right. It was Man, a Monday. It, it, I was in my trailer because, you know, back then I still used to rhyme and everything. So I'm listening to beats all the time, rhyming. And so I'm sitting in the trailer listening to music, bopping. And so the trail is kind of shaking because I'm bopping. And then the trailer started shaking. Now, I first thought somebody was playing a prank. One of so you guys like, like, like shaking the trailer. So I'm like, what the hell? And I could kind of hear people yelling. So I go open up the door. And I saw this big tree that was behind the trailer just sh- like somebody was just shaking it. And I was like, and people were running. We filmed on UCLA campus. And I was like, oh. And I just stood there. It was so surreal. And then it was over. And they were talking. I think we were at lunch because they said they were downstairs in some building having lunch. I was eating in a trailer and they was like people freaked out. And you could see like, um, I don't know if you remember this, in the stairwell where we filmed that fight scene. Yeah. There were like cracks. From it? From, yeah. From the big one and from that. That's crazy. It was crazy. That So that the Nas album... My first earthquake. How well, well, what else do you remember about? Like, I mean, we were so young. Yeah, we were you so You know, like young. young to the business, young to life. Like at that age, you think you know so much and you're so like, you don't know shit. Right, right. Well, what else do you remember like about that set? Like it was such a, for me, it was so exciting to like, I had seen you in Juice. You know, Cube was like, Fucking Ice Cube, yeah, Busta ice Rhymes, cube. Yeah. you know Regina King, you know she was Regina King. Like I Jennifer was like, Conley was in it. Yeah, I mean it was fucking dope. And John Singleton was like popping. This was yeah. after he had. I mean that was like, it was such an exciting place for me to be as an actor, and then to get to do this crazy part. Like I'm like, you know where I'm like, yo, I'm doing something totally against what I'm like, and you know like right. we're like you know on our fake you know Robert De Niro method acted shit. And I mean, what, what else do you like? Do you remember like? Uh, uh, you had to do a lot of stuff because you had done track. You were right. like, you, so I remember asking you, like, yeah, I had to fucking wake up and I was doing this track shit. And, yeah. You know, you had to like work out and shit like that. Yeah, it was intense, man. I mean, John was, um, it, it, John was intense back then. You know, he was young. He just coming off this big, you know, movie, Boys in the Hood. And so um, it's just interesting because, you know, I, I heard this after the fact, but like Tupac, he wanted Tupac to play that role. And you know that, you know that, Leonardo DiCaprio was going to play my part. That's crazy. I didn't know that. Leonardo DiCaprio was go- it was going to be Tupac and, and Leonardo, Leonardo- Di- and I was going to play Cole Hauser's part. Wow. The, the other skit. I was locked into that shit. Okay, Cole Hauser, do you remember this? Do you remember the day they couldn't find him? He was he didn't show up to set. Oh yeah. And Ooh. they were like what's going on? And they were calling him and he, you know, this is before like everybody had a cell phone right. and they sent someone to wherever he was staying and he was Dead sleep. He had right. went to a, I remember. a concert. I, I want to say a Pink Floyd concert. I remember. And whatever happened, happened. Right. You remember that? I do remember that. <laughs> Cole Yo, Hauser. this shit was, it was crazy. I, and I just remember, I also remember like the set was like, you know, I knew like I had certain things in my head that weren't written. I remember the scene when we were doing the scene in the dorm room where I pull a gun out on you. Oh, yeah. And I'm like saying all this crazy shit. I'm like, and I remember like, it was like a prime, it was like, especially at the time, it was like a mostly black set, mm-hmm. you know, because it was Singleton. Right. 
And I remember it was like, it wasn't like tense, like people, but people were like, you know, you're saying, you know, fuck this and end this and right. fuck this. And we're doing it take after take, take after, after yeah. And motherfuckers are like, how many times are you going to have to hear that shit? <laughs> and the more I did it, Singleton would like applaud. Like he was like, keep going because everybody, like I was like, I was like, felt alienated on this. Side. Like enough, fucking enough. Right. But I, I just remember one time when I was doing shit off camera, like I remember you looking at me like, what the, like, what, like, as you're at your head at the time, like, as an actor, and like you've done so much since, did you know what you were doing as an actor? Like you had went to LaGuardia. Like, mm. did you were you clear like what you were doing as an actor? Was everything sort of like were you learning? Because I was, I know I was learning on the job. Mm. That's a great question. I mean, I think I I, I knew what I was trying to do. Or uh -huh. I knew what I was aiming towards. You know, and I felt uh, a certain level of confidence in. I knew that I would commit. Right. You know, and so it's it's interesting that to. It's it's interesting to hear your thoughts because when I think back to that, I'm like, yeah, I never considered that back then. Right. You know what I mean? Like you kind of were alienated in a sense, but but you know when I think about it, it, and I've never spoken to John about this, but I wonder if he sort of created that on purpose. I think he did. So that we had that energy he for did. the characters. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and then so when they turn the cameras on, that energy's real and it's yeah. there. But you know what's interesting? Um, and you never like you you're like a low key dude. Like yeah. I'm talking like. You know, it's not like I'm not fucking. It was just like, yo, what's up? It was cool, but it was like I want to like talk to you about juice and shit. Right. Like I would, you know, like I want to like fuck ask you. To, I'm gonna ask you the questions that I'm getting to ask you now. Right. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's it's wild, man. I mean, we were just so fortunate. Um, I don't think uh, I I don't think any of us knew the power of what that story was about right. at that time. Right. You know, even when you think, I mean, you know, Fishburne, Jennifer, kind like so many great actors were in that, and it's kind of sad um scary and it's sad and scary to think we can watch that movie now and it, and it and it's like now it's not like there's any time frame that's passed right it's crazy and that's to that so I'm speaking to the power of of singleton storytelling yeah i mean it's, it was it's incredible because yeah. you, you can watch that film now man and it hits you yeah you know yeah absolutely it hits you like wow and it's you know it's just it's a sad state of affairs for us but I, I loved working with you. Yeah, it was so much fun. It, we had so much fun because we were kids, man, and we were getting to do our thing. And I we just, were going hard, take we after take. We were going take. hard, and like I remember, um, because uh, Pac had had just no, Pac was locked up then. Right, that's why he could like they that's were like, and then he got out, but they were like, we can't fucking finance like. Yeah, I, and they were like, you couldn't take a shot on them, and, and they couldn't get insurance for the movie. Right, so it's just you know Regina King Cube, and I mean Cube was dope. In that movie, yeah, but I think he kind of was was tuned into the greater story telling yeah, yeah, of yeah. it all. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, definitely more than I was in because he was like Tyra such a, Banks, right? That's crazy, motherfuckers! I swear, out of all the shit that I've done, that's probably the one's consistent thing. Yo, why you shoot Tyra? Why you shoot? Tyra? <laughs> People ask me to this day. They they like why you shoot Tyra? Like to to this day. Yo, you did your thing in that. We I, we all did. It was you fun, did your man. Thing. It was about I want to say like four months ago. It's like randomly like two in the morning. You know I couldn't sleep and it was on and I watched it and I'm like yo. I was like rap was killing this. <laughs> you was killed, but you know because on a on an actor level, there really was an art. Like right. when you first meet that character, he's not that guy. Right. And it was beautiful to watch him him, you know, transform and he was trying to transform. Right. And at the end, it's like he really wasn't that guy. Right. He never really changed into that dude. Right. So that was it was beautiful. Man. You know, someone came with me an idea. He was like, obviously the character killed himself, but if if we figured out a way to be like, oh, it was just a bad head wound. Like to do like <laughs> where me and Malik your character, we meet up now like in a coffee shop and like we hash things out. And, like it's like a, a, a satirical thing. That's hilarious. All right, so you went to LaGuardia High School, which is the famous performing arts high school in New York City for people that aren't from New York. It's a school that the movie Fame was based on. It was yeah. a school that mo the movie Fame was shot at. Um, I went to King, and I think how old are you? I'm 44. Okay, so you're. I had already left. Okay. But it you was went to Martin Luther King. I went to Martin Luther King. I, I didn't know that. Yeah, it was a fucking. It was a fucking Martin right Luther, across the street. Yeah, literally, like wow. a, like a, a small street. How did you wind up going to Laguardia and what? Because when I was in high school, I was I was like still thinking I'm gonna play basketball. Right. W w did you go to Laguardia to play? I mean, to become an actor? Yeah. And yeah. what was your head like? How did you get into Laguardia and like 
Why did you want to be an actor at, at such a young age? Um, well, for me, um, I kind of oh, – first, I thought I was going to be a running back in the NFL. So oh, I used to play, shit. I, I used to play that. football. Played for the Brooklyn Skyhawks, Pop Warner League team. Oh, shit. Okay. Yeah, so I was playing football, and um, but I was always into the arts, you know, because of my, my mom, my grandma, um, and I've been writing forever. Okay. So I used to write short stories, poems. I didn't know that. You know, raps, stuff like that. And the acting kind of became, I guess, an extension of the writing. Uh-huh. Um, and a combination of, you know, doing some school plays and stuff. And and Sidney Poitier was like my hero back okay. then. Okay. You know, and so um, there's no sort of uh, benchmark. Right. I just sort of was heading that way. And LaGuardia is it. You know, in New York, as far as performing arts, I was just like, that's where I want to go. And I went, you know, you got to audition. And like, what, like you're 15, 14, like what are you, are when in the ninth I went, grade? I was, uh, I was 12. Damn. Yeah, because I got skipped when I was younger. So I went to high school when I was 12, 16. So, so you go in there and you do an audition from a play or like a, a monologue? Like? Yeah, it was um, some, I don't remember the monologue. It was something from Shakespeare. That's crazy. You know, and you, you, you know, you have to audition for uh, the teachers. Or you know the people who had that department, and it's in. The, they had two theaters. They had the big one and the small one, and it was just really daunting. But you go in there and do your thing, and I was really, really um, confident. You know, I keep using that word because it was like I believed in okay. what I could bring. And, and, and so much of like when people ask me of of, of like well, I want to be an actor, I'm like, yo. There's no if, or I'm thinking about. Right. Like, when you just say confident, I'm, I tell motherfuckers, like, there's no dipping your toe in the pool. You got to jump in the fucking, right. the cold-ass pool. Right. And this is, you know, from when we came up, you know, the notion of you being in film and television is not what they're teaching you. They're teaching you, you know, you be good with some Broadway, and it's going to, and find your way in life. You know what I mean? Right. Like the the I But for me, so I get in, my freshman year, um, Carl Payne is a senior. Um, Cockroach from, co- from I mean, the Cosby t- Show. Dondre Whitfield is a senior. He oh, plays. Shit. So I'm like, this is crazy. You're like seeing stars in there. To me, they were stuck. Yeah. I'm like, I just saw this dude on TV last week, and they go to my school. So the idea is like, oh, this can work, you know. And I and I'm when I think about it now, it's like we have to think about the entertainment business how it was was back then, right? You know what I mean? It's completely different than it is now. Right. His name, this is. Pre YouTube, pre Netflix, pre right. stream. This is, you know, the these five companies control everything. Right. You know what I mean? Right. <laughs> There's no all these subsidiaries in a thousand channels. Yeah, it's channel yeah, yeah. two, channel four, channel five. You know what I mean? Right. And HBO wasn't even HBO. HBO wasn't even. They just HBO. played movies and shit. Yeah. And inside so, the NFL. So the idea of like, yo, this it, the timing of it was, I guess, uh, serendipitous because, you know, this is. In spikes, like right after his, you know, the spike renaissance, and in terms of, of for black film, that it it had just was gearing up, you know what I mean, like that new wave. So I was just fortunate to the timing to come at that new wave because it was like, you know, you think about we had you got Boys in the Hood on mm-hmm. the West Coast, and you had Juice mm-hmm. on the East Coast, and and then what was the other one? Um, Menace. Menace. That's what I was missing. Yep. Yeah, you had those. Those were the three. They're just like boom. Mm-hmm. It, you know, the whole new uh, black film renaissance mm-hmm. happened. You know, so just a, a, a victim of good circumstances. And who else? Like, I mean, people. Adrian Brody's went to the Adrian school. I mean, there's Brody a list the of this yeah. this kid who just got nominated for an Oscar. Young kid. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, you, I know Marlon Wayans. Marlon who's Wayans. Like you guys, like Rory click. Cochran. It's crazy, bro. They were like, all there, like yeah, we were all there at the same time. That's like, crazy. I remember going to school with Adrian Brody. Like, I remember that dude. You know what I mean? I remember Rory Cochran. Like, that's the homie. Like, and it's just wild because the. I mean, the, when you look at the school's alumni, is it's crazy. I mean, that's nuts. De Niro, Pacino. I think Nicki Minaj. Went yeah, Nicki Minaj. Was, you know she's I mean? younger than than both yeah. of us. But but just like the amount of. It, you know, the school holds 2,500 students. So you feel like in the drama department, I, I don't know what the number is, but let's just make one up. Let's mm-hmm. just say it's 200 kids, mm-hmm. right? You know, out of that 200 kids, how many go on to, mm-hmm. you know, to 
to work in the business. Is there plays put on by LaGuardia? Like at the time, like probably now they have like films and short films because you could do it on your phone and right. digital. But like, is there like that must be competitive because you got all motherfuckers. It's not like a normal school where it's like, oh, I want to be in the play and somebody who really wants to do it's going to be Shakespeare, uh, going right. to be King Lear. Like was was there like, what, uh, was there plays put on by the, yeah. Was, they, it, was it competitive? Oh, super Cause competitive. Because everybody's there for that. Yeah. And it's, it's like, like a sports school but acting. Yeah. And it's like, <laughs> that's a perfect, perfect analogy. Um, <laughs> And you know, it's it's like it, it's like any high school in a sense that the seniors are the ones. I got you. You know what I mean? So the seniors are the like the, you know, those are the special group. Right. And for me, I think even for Marlon, um, you know, we would we were dead serious about that thing, man. We were serious. I mean, so they did do plays within the year and then it all uh culminated with what they call the spring drama festival. Got you. So that was when it's like this the whole drama department is putting on for the whole school and you know it's gonna be this, it's gonna be that. And what's beautiful, or at least back then, uh, I would imagine they do the same thing now. But so once you're a senior, they have what's called a, a, a showcase. Okay. And it's super dope because what they do is they bring in like casting agents, you know, different younger junior age, you know, to come watch this senior class. Mm-hmm. And so you you pick a partner, you know, by then me and Marlon would, you know, like, you know, we would thick as thick as thieves. That's a talented crew. And we we um you know we did a scene. Do you remember um, what you did? We did a scene from I want to say it was August Wilson's one of August Wilson's plays. He'll probably remember. And um and we killed it. Uh. You know. And then that's kind of like you know after then you like you know maybe a manager or agent might want to take a meeting. They with reached you. out to you and stuff. Yeah, because they're there and they'll slip you their card and you know we're kids. Right. So, so we don't know. About and then you're like, oh shit. You know, and then they, you know, you might have a meeting. You might, that's how I got my first agent. All right, Omar, let me take a break real quick. And I want to talk about this World Cup. You thought that I was out of my mind. I'm not out of my mind. The World Cup is the talk of the sports world this summer. And if you follow me on Instagram, you know I have been betting on nearly every game. Straight bets, prop bets, betting on individuals and parlays. My bookie has it all. Come bet with me or against me at mybookie.ag. Sign up now. Use the promo code CUP, C-U-P, to get a 50% bonus on your first deposit. And listen, if you're not a soccer guy or soccer girl, then the Big Three is going every Friday night this summer, and the action is fantastic. That's right. You can bet on all Big Three games. You can bet on the games this week in Chicago. What team's going to win it all with the promo code big 3 Wrap? And that gives you a 100% bonus with your first deposit. We're also taking bets on where LeBron James is going to wind up this season. We're also taking bets on where LeBron James is going to wind up this offseason and where Kawhi Leonard is going to wind up this season. Make sure you get your account because we're going to be playing at mybookie.ag all summer long. Go to mybookie.ag, use the promo code CUP to get a 50% bonus on your first deposit on World Cup games. Let's do this. I want this action. How long after you left LaGuardia did you get juice? It's so bizarre, man. That's why it's like I was telling someone the other day, you know, the first like four years of my career was like a, it was like a movie. It was surreal. It was surreal. Everything happened so fast. I was just like, you know, and it's it, it was bizarre. So I get out of school summer of 90. Um I booked juice like somewhere before that next new year, before 91. Somewhere. Wow. So it's like that summer, late in the summer, I booked juice. And then we're filming this movie. It's crazy. It was like, I was like, uh, I'm, I was thinking about, you know, maybe I'll, you know, I'm, I didn't want to go straight to college. I think Marlon went up to Howard. Right. I was like, oh, I'll just work and I, you know, let me figure out what I want to do. I didn't know if I wanted to. Because you knew you wanted to do something. Yeah, I knew I wanted to do the acting thing, but I was like, all right, am I going to, you know, go straight to school and or maybe I should take, you know, let me take this year and work and audition and uh-huh. see what picks up. And it was just like, boom, you know, I, I, I booked Juice. Uh, I remember the first time I met Pac, it was um, my... Agent at the time, so so we they had the cattle call, so you know that's they're seeing thousands of people, actors, non actors, actors rappers, everybody. rappers, cousins. It's crazy. So even going up to that whatever that office was to audition was nuts because it would be like three hundred people in there. So you know we go in, 
do the thing, get a call back, get another call back. So I probably had like five or six callbacks. Uh-huh. And then what was interesting was they were like, all right. And then it was like they were they were pairing us up. So since it was like four kids, it was just like, all right, you two and you two. Okay, you read for this role. You read for that role. And they had me reading for Bishop. Then it was like, okay, read for Q. Okay, try this one. All right, come in with this group. And that just process just went on and on. And then there was like a, I guess they had narrowed it down, but then they had like this dinner. And so <laughs> my agent at the time was like, all right, you got to go to this dinner. Um, the director's going to be there. And it's, and it's Ernest, Dickerson. Ernest Dickerson. And there's hype on him because he's shot do the, do the right thing. Yeah, and so, all the spike shit. Right. Ernest like, is the man. He's the fucking dude. And especially like do the right thing at the time was so aesthetically. Incredible. Incredible. And it's beautiful. Spike's disciple. So this guy's like the next fucking guy. Right. So we go into this dinner and, and, and my agent at the time was like, um, you know, I don't know what's going to happen, but they're really hot on this guy, Tupac. <laughs> They really love this guy, Tupac Shacker. You remember he said, <laughs> I remember that. And I was like, okay. And they were like, just make sure you sit next to him. Try to sit next to him. That's fucking funny. You know how agents do. And, you know, as it, as it would have it, you know, me and Pac, you know, I met him. We sit on opposite sides of the table. You know, we're in our own worlds doing our own thing. And then... Um, it and he like, had, had he had rocked with Digital Underground at the time. He had rocked with Digital Underground at that time. Same song, right? Yeah, and but what, he hadn't he hadn't put out a, a record, right? No, he was he was in the midst of recording his first record. Okay, so it was just like he rocked on the song, like you, you know, yeah. he, like he did the one verse on the song, like oh, it's cool, like you nobody, you know, it's like and it's not a know, big deal. Digital was dope, but it was kind of like right. you know, play play, right, like, right, you know what I mean. Right. So it was like, you know, I'm from Brooklyn, New York, so like yo, hip you're from Bed Stuy, yeah. So we like. You know, it, but he was a cool dude. And um, what do you remember about him, like a young Tupac? Which I'm sure you got asked a zillion times. But like at that dinner, like when you're seeing like the essence of him, you're on your bed style shit. Yeah. You had an edge about you. You know what? What do you remember like about that person that you saw even before he got officially cast in Juice? Pac had a mission. He had a special <laughs> energy. You know how some people just have a there's there's something about their aura, there's something in their eyes uh -huh. where it's just like, and what's crazy is the way that Pac got Juice, he went with Tretch. Right. Tretch had the audition. He was just rolling with the homie. And then they were like, hey, you, you, you try to come, you know what I mean? Because I remember in, in, before that dinner, there was a certain point where we had the audition together. Where I, they, it was like, uh, it was two other dudes and me and Pac. But it wasn't Jermaine or uh, Khalil. Uh -huh. And, it, you know, this was when they were still doing this, you know, do -si do But after, you know, after we had the dinner, um, I got the call from Ernest. He called me. Um, and, and, and then just Pac was just a special dude, man. Like, his, he had so much. You could just tell. It was just like, what, I, something's got to come out of this guy. Mm. You know? And his style back then. You know, people, after the fact, it, it's all, you know accepted but back then it was like he doubles and triples and quadruples his vocals you know everybody was kind of like what he had a different cadence you know um and his sound was not the norm mm -hmm. not that any artist should want to be the norm mm -hmm. but i'm just saying it was a, a risk uh-huh you know if you want to put it that way uh-huh but it was just like you know what what he was into um a beautiful story about pop and this is real one morning um we were, you know, getting a set or whatever, and he had the papers, and some woman had like thrown a baby in the trash, which is horrible, you know. But we from New York, you hear about stuff like that all the time. And he was just so incensed, he just couldn't. He kept talking about it, like, man, how could somebody do that? And I'm like, bro, it's the hood, like, you know. And at lunchtime, he was like, yo, oh, um, come in the trailer. We uh, we had honey wagons though, <laughs> right? Or you do? We had the small joints, right? So come in the trailer, and he starts rapping. This this thing to me, and I'm like, yeah, that's that's dope, that's cool. Like he's rapping this, but it's not clicking, right? And then a few months after we finished the movie, and his album drops, and Brenda, Brenda's got a baby Are comes out. Are you serious? Out. And I'm like, as soon as I heard the lyrics, I'm like, oh, that's the joint, and it blew my mind. That was Brenda's got a baby. That's fucking dope. Incredible. So that's you know that that, that could kind of wrap Pac up in, in um, not that you ever could, but he was just a beautiful person man he was a powerful brother way more well read than what people would think mm -hmm. especially for you guys were young yeah we were young but he was very intelligent 
Like that's very, dope. very intelligent. Like book read, I mean. That's dope. You know what I mean? And and um, but he was driven, man. He had a purpose and and um and he had a mission. That's dope. You know, I was like, you know, even like what ended up happening to Pac, I was kind of mad at Pac for in in I know that's weird to say, but I mean like for having allowed that to happen, like, yo, you were supposed to be here with us. You were supposed to be here. We were supposed to grow and evolve. You know, shit happens, but I'm just saying, like, man, because I, I saw Pac the night he got shot. Are you serious? Yeah, man. I saw Pac that... So we were all in Vegas for the fight. Me, Marlon, our other boy Mitch. Um, right. I think our other boy E. Willis was with us. And Mitch is a kid who goes, you the one who got the juice Yeah, that's, that's my bro, <laughs> right? So... Actor. We, um... We go to the fight. We don't know any of these things that's happened, you know, with, with Pac and Chug and all of that. We don't know. We're staying at the same hotel. We didn't know that either. We're staying at the Luxor. And we pull up in a cab and you see this crowd, hundreds of dudes around or whatever. And we getting out. We about to go upstairs and change, you know, go party or whatever. And you just hear that voice. Grr, grr. <laughs> I was like, oh, yo, that's Pac. And I hadn't seen Pac probably at that point in like two years. So... I, you know, I didn't know they just had a fight. I don't know none of this. So I just go up into the crowd and he had his back turned and I just pushed him mad hard. When I think back to this now, I'm like, I could have just got the pulp beat out of me because they think, you know what I mean? But I pushed him and he turned around. He's like, oh, oh, what's up? You know, and we hugged and everything, you know. This was after what turned out to be that fight? Right. This is right after that, right before, this is right before he gets in the car. So... You know, we chopping it up. It's like, yo, you know, what you, what you doing, man? All right, let's get up later. He was like, yeah, we going to this party. All right, yeah, maybe we hit, we, we hit y'all up after that. And so Whoa. we ended up, I was talking to him probably for like a half, so we didn't even go upstairs and change. We was just like, all right, let's just jump back in the cab. And, and we jumped back in the cab and went like to eat or something. We ended up not going out. And then, then after we go eat, we're like, all right, let's go out. And traffic on the strip was just at a standstill. Because the shooting that happened. We didn't know the shooting that happened, but we was like, yo, what's, we in this cab for like 45. We was like, yo, let's just go back upstairs and, and chill. And then we found out um, e, e came at like 5 in the morning knocking on the door like, yo. It was like, yo, Pac got shot. And we was, <laughs> it was it's bizarre because we were all like, we paused and then we was like, ah, he be all right. He always getting shot. But then like an hour later, once you saw it on CNN and like the severity of. Damn. Yeah. Crazy, man. That's fucking crazy, man. Crazy, crazy, bro. But it was just like, damn, man. Like, Pac, Pac was would it would have been great to see him evolve, especially as an actor. I agree. As an actor, because he was nice. He, he was, was so good. Oh, he was so good, and he had so much in him. Specific, I'm talking about specifically as an actor. Oh, he he could have did some incredible things, man. I agree. I mean, when I saw you guys in in Juice. You know, uh, one of my favorite scenes, I would put it in one of my... T I've talked about it on this show. I've talked about it before. I've stolen <laughs> shit from his performance in Juice. I mean, I, I, one of my favorite scenes, I would say in top 10 scenes in, in movies, is uh, when you guys, when he first bugs out, when you guys are watching the TV, and he's like, fuck chill. Oh, yeah. Yo, big man, if you want respect, you got to earn it. You damn right. You gotta be ready to go down, stand up, and die for that shit like Blizzard did if you want some juice. Blizzard? Blizzard ain't sticking up to nothing now. That's because we wasn't there to back him up. If we was if there, we was there, it'd be five that niggas instead of one. Specifically that, like, and I'm fanning out because, like, <laughs> like but when you were on the set of that, like, that scene, mm -hmm. what, what was that scene written as? How much was improv between you guys, if you remember, like, you know, because that's like an iconic scene, and then the other iconic scene is why you you guys are by the lockers, oh, yeah. and the way, like, the camera moves, and he's like, you know what, I am crazy. Right. Uh, you, you know, you said I was crazy before. Uh, um, but, like, what do you remember, like, uh, specifically about that first scene when you were shooting it? When we were, it was intense. Now, so we- Was that, like, an audition scene? It's like, one of the scenes that you did over and over and over, like, through the auditions? I don't, I honestly don't remember that. Okay. Um, but- we basically freestyle juice, you know what I mean? Because the the original script was like, you know, Ernest and those guys are a little bit older, right? So a lot of the verbiage was not the slang. And yeah, shit. it was like jive turkey. Like, nah, we not. <laughs> <laughs> we was like, yo, that's not what it's gonna oh, be. Shit. <laughs> but Shaft in Harlem, shit. Yeah. So you know, we would 
as you know, like as a as an actor, especially being that young, and it's like, yo, we just kind of finding it improv. And now the beats were there, you know, on the paper in terms of all right, you know, story points. Like we got to get that information out. Say this, say that. But a lot of it, I, and I know for sure, like with Pac was just it was just poetry. He was just finding. So it was fun because you didn't ne- necessarily know what you know what he was gonna come with, what I'm gonna come with. You know what I mean? And we were, it was a, when I think back to that, it was like, it was an interesting um, experience, like as a, as an actor, because it's, you know, Bishop was that character. He has all the the things he's going to, he's the crazy one. He can right. say the craziest things he can blah, 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 blah. So how do you, how do you have a presence in that without trying to compete with it? Right. You know what I mean? I know exactly what you, you mean. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, so it was like, that's where, that's the zone Your I was in. Your character's not crazy, like, but then the actor and the person you and like, you're like, I, I know exactly you what know you what mean. mean. It's a fine I, line. Yeah, it's a fine line because it's like, you know, I had, for Q, he had to bring it too. Right. You know, but it was A it different way. A different way. And, and at the end of the day, it's like, and I tell uh, aspiring actors when I talk to them, you know, it's one of those things where you have you really have to be in character because it's not a sport, it's not a competition, right? You know, it's, it doesn't work that way, right? You, you have you have to anchor the character for the betterment of the story, right? You know what I mean? I know exactly what so you mean. So just you, when you look back at like that that scene was in that scene was intense, and I remember Jermaine just was kind of wide eyed because you know Pac was unpredictable, so he might go this way, might go that way, you know, and his levels of 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 intensity would just go up and down and up, you know. And Pac was on some method. Was he? Yeah, he was on some method acting. Like, we, and we was on that back, you know. Right. For certain scenes, you know, you know how it is. Like, well, all right, we we busting out fifty push ups. Right. All right, let's do this. All right, let's do that. You know what I mean? And um, man, I remember so much. You know, it's nothing like your first. Yeah, yeah, yup, yup. It's yep. nothing like your first. And for me, it was like again, I look back on it now, and it's just like surreal, you know, because I was. I was taking a train to set. Right. You know, and I, at that time, I lived all the way out in Star City in like East New York. Right. So, you know, it was a low budget movie. They didn't have, you know, oh, we're going to drive out there and get you. So I ended up staying with the first AD. Oh, shit. While we filmed because he lived right by the Brooklyn Bridge and uh-huh. we filmed in Harlem. So they was like, yo, that that's too long for you to get. Can you stay with him? Right. I did that. Your dog is snoring right he's now. Cool. <laughs> he's cool. He's enjoying it. That's crazy. Yeah, had the turntables in the in the crib. Cause your character DJ, yeah. had you DJed before? Nah, I hadn't DJed before. Who like, was like your DJ coach? DJ Scratch. He, Scratch was your guy. Yeah, Scratch EPMD was my guy. DJ, one of the best. Yeah, Scratch. You know, taught me how to. And he, it was basically his cuts. Who was in the movie? Right. So I kind of just would practice mimicking his cuts, and um. It, that's a you know this this is real DJ and not like Serato so it's, yeah 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 it, it ain't for everybody yeah <laughs> you know what I'm that saying? shit's hard right that shit is really hard um, it's but like I, you some know, like you know like left hand right hand like you know ambidextrous weird shit like yeah. I, I've tried to do it and I'm like I don't know like, like when they doing all that crazy shit like it's some coordination it's, shit yeah but it's it's for certain people you right. know what I mean so it's like it, it give you a, a a a deeper appreciation of cats like Jazzy Jeff and, right you know like legendary right d- you know DJ like where they can make DJs. that it's like an orchestra they can do whatever the fuck they want with yeah it. incredible but yeah man that was you know I you know I juice will always hold a special place in my yeah heart. yeah yeah when when you look and you see like you know there's paintings of it there's t-shirts of it there's t-shirts of you there's t-shirts of Tupac there's t-shirts of you know the whole cast that that look you know you're the one who's got the juice the the Eric B and Rakim song right. you know uh, the ledge and like when you look back and are you like now are you able to have like a perspective like I did something that was fucking like that's like something to be a part of and shit yeah yeah I'm very proud about it you know what I mean because it's 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 so uh, amazing to see like it the younger generations are on it like it just came out, you know, and that's that's been to me, for me like the most powerful thing because you know we we get our opportunities we we all try to do great work and stuff like that and and you want it to be profitable and all right, that right. and um but then when it's like if if you're fortunate enough to look up and it's you know twenty something years later and it's like man people still love that thing right that's an amazing feeling. Um, you mentioned Sydney Portier. Like now, there's so many um, successful 
uh, black actors and actresses. Right. You know, uh, just like your generation and your contemporaries, whether it's Marlon, Wood Harris, right. Morris Chestnut, right. uh, you know, obviously, you know, Pac, Most Def. I mean, there's there's a there's a lot of dudes. You know, Chadwick Boseman. These, these are younger dudes. There's so many sort of references. There's you know, obviously Denzel being the the creme de la creme with right. Morgan Freeman and Samuel Jackson. You know, but when you were coming up, you mentioned Sidney Portia. That's like, you know, at the time in the late 80s, mid 80s, when you're in high school, he's not popping. He's like, you know, he's older. Right. You know, like, so what was your reference? Like, who were you looking up to? Who were you excited by besides Sidney Portia? Because there wasn't that many dudes. Yeah. It, like now there's there's a lot and right. it's, it's gone so much further and you're one of those people. But who else were you sort of like, I want to be like that? That's an interesting question. Um, for me, I can't say... I had that reference because you're right because it really weren't, you know, I mean, outside of like all the actors that was in Spike Lee movies or you right. know, was seeing those guys come. But for me, it was it was Portier because just as a kid, you know, watching Raising in the Sun and just watching. And at that time, it's like you had to wait for it to come on TV. Right. You know what I mean? And right. it's like on the Saturday afternoon, it's right. in black and white. Um, there was something about his presence and his power that spoke to me. Um so for me, like at that point, I was more looking at like sports for that. I got you. You know what I mean? Like that vibe. This is MJ. This is you know. I got Doc you. J. Like so, I'm looking. Is it was about the energy. I got but as you. As an actor, like I was really like super intense and focused, and I felt like I had to. I had to be that guy. I got you for myself. I got you. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's interesting because. It's changed so much for the better. Yeah. I mean, like just the people that I named off the top. I mean, it's like, it's like and obviously there's Wesley. Right, Wesley. You know, Denzel was on this is like but saying elsewhere. When, but even but when you when you audition for LaGuardia, like if I win the time, like Wesley wasn't popping. Like he started playing, right. you, you know, like a, you know, like he was like 87, 88. Yeah. And, and even then it wasn't like, you know, and Denzel's on saying elsewhere. All right, he's right. on saying, but he wasn't like. You know, your jaw's not dropping at like his like the skills level, like this fucking guy. Right. You never would have thought that guy, but like, oh, he's a good actor. Right. To turn into one of the best to ever do it. Right. So it's an interesting sort of like, you know, like what you had your focus on. You played in higher learning. We mentioned, you know, track, major league, you, you two baseball, yeah. um, love and basketball. And and this is when you're young. You're like, I'll do whatever. And you wake up. I'll do it. A trainer. Like all these athletic <laughs> roles. Like, was is that, is that shit like a pain in the ass? Like, I mean, or, or you like embrace it? Because like you like do like a you could play baseball. I'm sure you could hit a fucking baseball properly. Or you know how to look like it. Right. You know how to run track. When you're doing love and basketball, like they got you with a basketball dude, and you're yeah. like, you're all basketball all the time. Yeah. I mean, that was that was that was tough. I mean. It, it just happened the way that it happened. You know, after I did the program, which I had a blast that's doing. That's football. Yeah, that's football. And again, so, so growing up, I played football. Right. So for me... You're a little bit more comfortable with that. And I'm like a kid in a candy store. I'm kind of getting to live out one of my little dreams. You're you know like what running I mean? and shit. You know, getting, and t you know, real hits and all of that. And then Major League, so the writer and director for the program, David Ward, he had also written... And direct the major league. Okay. And so when we were getting to the end of doing the program, he came to me and was like, hey, you know, I'm doing a sequel in major league. Like, would you be down? And I didn't want to do it, but I felt like a loyalty. Like, hey, this guy gave me my second job. Because it, did you not want to do it because like the Wesley comparison? Yeah, I just didn't understand. I was just like the West, like didn't Wesley play in that, you know, and I'm young and I'm like, I don't want to do another sport. I don't want to get type, you know, right. I'm thinking all those things, but I'm like, he was just like, you know, it's not going to happen with Wesley, so I want you to do it. And I was just like, all right, I'll do it. You know what I mean? And then, you know, higher learning just happened to be, they said, hey, he's on a track scholarship. Okay. So I was out there at UCLA again with a different trainer. Um, loving basketball was tough. Um, I love watching basketball, but it's not necessarily my favorite sport to play. Uh -huh. And it's like, it's cool. It's one of those things where, you know, if, if you're filming a football movie, you know, when the cameras are rolling, it is what it is. Right. Because I can I can hit or I can take the hit. Right. With basketball, you can hit every shot when the cameras are not rolling. Right. And when they come on, you miss every shot. Right. That's annoying. Right. And I'm competitive. Right. So I kind of have that pride where it's just like, you know, when you're on set filming and then they bring in a hundred extras and all, you know, people talking shit. Right. Like, yeah, you can't really shoot. And it's like, and they see you like, oh, yo, he could really pull that. And then when the cameras come on, they like, air ball. Right. <laughs> so there was a lot of that. But 
I had fun doing that movie too. Um, I mean, there's so much that I could talk about. Like, yeah. you know, you've done so much stuff, you know, like TV. But I, I mean, you like, you, I, like I, I've always like felt a camaraderie to you. Like, and I've always been like happy to see you do your shit. Same and, here. Bro. And and you've evolved with uh, uh, you know, the times and television and all that stuff. Before I get to the book, I want to talk hip hop because I know you're a hip hop dude. Yes. I, you, I like you used to rhyme. Yeah. You know, like I just know you're a fan. Like from like even like with the Nas shit. Um, let me ask you the, the obligatory question. <laughs> you know what this obligatory question is going to be, right? I, I assume so. All right. Excluding Tupac and excluding Biggie. Okay. Okay, because he's a bed dude. Uh, uh, let's say obligatory Omar Epps today. And, and I know you don't want to leave anybody out. And right. you know, it's today. It's crazy. The 25th anniversary of Reasonable Doubt. I just it's saw today? it. today? Oh, that's crazy. It's fucked up. I'm like 20, 93. Like where did, where did the time go, motherfucker? <laughs> so 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 I want to get the obligatory, and I'll let you get a cherry on top. Obligatory Omar Epps, your favorite MCs. They could be from now. They it could be, and if you want to do eight, and you just get on a roll, but it's the obligatory question I got to ask. But you Omar, said excluding pocket, excluding big? pocket big, excluding pocket. Big. Yeah, they can, they can't be on the list. They can't be on the list. They can't be on the list. All right, so we're gonna go J. Okay. We're gonna go Nas. Okay. We gonna go, Rakim. Yep. I think we gotta go. Kane. Long live the Kane. I think we gotta go Kane. You're bed dude. That's like. And I think. See now, I'm thinking like. Hmm. Who would be five? Don't placate any of these 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 no, half not, half good motherfuckers. I'm thinking. I'm gonna tell you honestly what I'm thinking is I'm I'm thinking Little Wayne. I'm thinking Kooji rap. Then I'm thinking KRS. So it's, I don't know, that last spot is probably I'll a medley. Okay. A medley of a few people. Okay, I'll let you take all those dudes because it's a tough question. Real quick, Kane, you're a bed dude. And it was just these anniversaries. I don't know who keeps track of these fucking anniversaries, but somebody right. keeps, because they'll do like, they won't just do the 25th anniversary. They'll do like the 33rd anniversary, the 22nd, <laughs> right. the 22nd anniversary <laughs> in six months. Long live the Kane just turned 30 years that's crazy so as a bed dude and Shout as a fan of hip-hop yeah you're also like you know when you started it was like the albie shore shit you know it was like light-skinned dudes you came in you special know, ed no? yeah you, came, you know <laughs> you had the good hair and you know you had his curly caribbean shit i was in high school because before i went to Martin Luther King, i was at erasmus with special ed oh you went to erasmus yeah which okay. was a fucking nut house yeah so so just real quick kane especially as a bed dude and you know little daddy shit what does Big Daddy Kane mean to you? Speak on Kane. Kane is is one of my heroes, like in a sense of, you know, what what he spoke to not only just black men, but at the time, like, you know, brown skin, you know, young black men. And he was smooth with it, you know, but he was just so nice lyrically. He could spit what a lot of people well they would know from that time, but Kane also put on a hell of a show. Like, this wasn't just, you know, a dude with a mic walking around. You know, he had Scoob and Scrap, so you would just see the performances and be blown away. But for me, it was just like Kane, you know, Bobby Brown, and um, Dwayne Wayne from um, <laughs> A Different World, mm -hmm. Kadeem Hardison. Mm -hmm. It was just like, all right, that squad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, because to your point at the time, and this is all jokingly, but, and then, you know, Kane was from Brooklyn. Right. You know, and came, so he would. He, he was so Brooklyn. He was so Brooklyn, and he would be, you know, trying to drop knowledge here and there. You know, he came with the battle, you know, battle rap type flow. But his first album, like, I remember the first time I heard Ain't No Half Stepping, it was like, it was like, you, it, you felt like you heard, like, this was something from a different planet. Like, what is that? You know what I mean? <laughs> like, and then he was like, yo, that's Kane. And you see the video and you like, yo, because it's back then video still meant something. So you would hit a song and then you would be clamoring to, to see the video, you know, and then the video like better deliver, you know, because you got a whack video. We like, ah, you know what I mean? But this is back then too, where, where just hearing the song meant something and, you know, you pop your tape in, you know, they play it on Mr. Magic or something like that. You record it, you know, on a double cassette. And then we just playing it back over and over, and then your tape pop. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then you get mad. But Kane was dope, man. Rock him, another one of my heroes, like just lyrically, 
you know, it would it felt like when I was a kid listening to those guys, it felt like eating a plate of home cooked food mm-hmm. versus going to like McDonald's. Like mm-hmm. I, you, the stuff would go way over your head, and then it's like two months later, you saying a line or you in a situation or a conversation with somebody and that line come up and you're like, oh, that's what he meant. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like I miss that, mm-hmm. you know, in the music and, uh, you know, Public Enemy, you know, Chuck D and, and the messaging was so powerful because when you think back to that time, like, man, the unity was strong, you know, just amongst us. Mm-hmm. The unity was strong and people in the community cared. It, the, the village was raising the child, mm-hmm. you know? And um, and that music reflected that, mm-hmm. you know. So for me, I don't knock the young dudes now. Like you know, you could bop to some of it, whatever. But there's no, there's like for me, I rock with now like Kendrick, you know, J Cole, mm-hmm. like cast like that, mm-hmm. Meek Mill, like yep. you know what I mean. Yep. With that, because I, I get that energy, right. I get that vibe right. from them, you know. Right. In in this, you know, this time, and right. they're speaking to their issues, but I get that, like yeah. That's that feeling, you know, and and I get it from who I get it from. The cast I don't get it from. I don't knock it. It's just not my bag, you right? Know? You know. Um. All right, good. Because I, I mean, I, I could have a whole I am rap poor stereo podcast. <laughs> we could just go hip hop down, but I like just wanted to like slice into it. So I read your book from fatherless to fatherhood. Thank you, brother. And um, it's very emotional. And you know, knowing you and knowing how you have presented yourself, and you know, like you're a low key dude. Like this is like. It's so revealing because you like you play it close to the vest. Like you're chill. Like you're a Brooklyn dude. Like, yeah. like I'm like you're a Brooklyn dude. Like people like that are not from New York. They're like, what does that mean? It's like you don't know that much about Brooklyn dudes. Like Kane, right? Jay Z. Like it's just like a Brooklyn it is, thing. It is. And people are like, what the fuck does that mean? But you, it, I know because I. It's like it's Teddy, just some Brooklyn shit. Like Teddy Riley's a Harlem dude, right? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, People be like, well, what do you mean? I'm like, yeah, they wear leather jackets with the collar up. Right. Like, that's what they Cam do. Cam a Harlem dude. Like, Cam so you runs know, a Harlem like, you know, dude. Talk, like, talk. Like, it's just a different... Yeah. It's just a different, like, you know, like, I don't know if it's still the same way, like, in the Fire Bros. Like, Queens would be like, yeah, that's a Queens dude. Nas is a Queens dude. Right. You feel me? Yeah, like, exactly. Like, you see now, he's like, yo, that's Queens dudes. Cool J is an older Queens. Like, it's yep. it's just a different <laughs> thing. And then, you know, obviously, Woo, bro, like, I didn't even know Staten Island had motherfuckers. Right, but right. Like, <laughs> Apparently, they have some shit going on out there. <laughs> right. And the Bronx had their, like, yeah. you know, Fat Joe's Tim down. So, like, you know, the thing that was uh, surprising about the book, and I didn't even know what it was, and obviously, I got the cover. I was like, okay, this is, this is your book. This isn't, a, like, a story about, like, you know, this is very specific. Was it hard to be so, like, revealing and personal and, and just sort of share, like, your emotions and, like, your vulnerability mm-hmm. in this book uh, that you wrote? And why did you do it? Yeah, well, it's, it wasn't hard to share my story. It was challenging to tell it in the right way. Meaning, like, so if I ask you... A hey, rap, tell me about your life. Unwittingly, you'll probably just give me the cliff notes because you know you. Mm-hmm. And then I'll be like, yeah, but how'd you get from this to that? Mm-hmm. And how'd you go from there? And it's like, oh, I gotta fill in the details. So that part was challenging to to sort of look at myself in third person so that the story is full. So you're crafting the story, so you you're not like because you right, you know all the details. I know that all the details, so I could just write this thing, but it was just like, no, I'm I'm really trying to give the the reader the uh the real, you right. know what I mean? Like, this is really what, you know, I went through and this is really what I felt at this point. And, you know, what made me, um, what made me want to write the book was I had a moment with my son um, a few years back when he was way younger. You know, I had worked one of them 14, 15 hour days. I was tired. I came home. <laughs> I just wanted to, you know, have a glass of wine and go to sleep. And wifey's like, yo, you know, he's still up. You know, so why don't you play with him, whatever. I'm like, ah. Like I'm tired, right? You know, in my mind, and in my mind, I thought at least I'm here, and that thought just kind of kept echoing, like what? Yeah, because obviously I love my son, right? I got so, you. but I'm like, where where did that come from? And and I started to think, man, did did somehow did growing up fatherless had it crept into my fatherhood? And mm. I started this journey. I wanted to explore that. You know, and it became like an exploration of self, and it just started coming out through this form. You know, and 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 I, I realized like, wow, man, like, you know, there's a lot of uh, young men out there that have gone through the same. 
I think in especially in the urban communities, I even say it in the book where I'm like, growing up, I only knew two of my friends that knew their fathers. And we That's thought so fucking crazy. And we thought they were the weirdos. Right. That's, That's like unusual. Crazy. Yeah, that was unusual. It was like, huh? And so Like your we, father's around? Yeah, that was unusual. That's bugged out. It's bugged out. So for me, because for just, me, like I like one of the things I'm like, it like obviously being around folks that have dealt with the shit, like I'm used to it now, but I remember like being young, I'm like, you don't know your father. Right. Because my father was around. Like right. I was, you know, my parents were divorced, but I pretty much live with my father. But like the fact that your reality is so much different and it's so it's so fucked up to have that as a reality. Right. Right. You know? Yeah. I and mean, that's why it's like I I, I dove in and you know, I'm Ultimately, you know, I want I want the book to be used as a tool of inspiration and potentially even, you know, some guidance. I mean, to each his own, but maybe it could spark, you know, mm -hmm. some ideas. And what I really want to do is change the narrative on fatherhood, you know, for, for all communities. Mm -hmm. Because it's not, you know, one interesting thing about being out here talking about this book is it doesn't matter the color. It doesn't matter the the, uh, the economics. Like it affects everyone. Mm -hmm. I'm meeting you know older white businessmen who are like, hey, yeah, yeah I didn't have my phone. You know what I mean? Or who, whoever, whoever. Um, so it, I want to change the narrative where that's not cool. Right. Like if we in the barber shop, me and you there, and the homie, and we know he's not handling that, he's not allowed. That's not cool anymore. We're not overlooking this anymore. Right. You know because I think. Not to get political, but, you know, people constantly hear people say we got to take back our communities. We can't take back any community without first taking back the family. Mm -hmm. And so, it, you know, it's just about creating a stable environment for a kid. And I'm, I'm and this is for women, too. Like this, the, the book is I think everyone can take something from it. But mm -hmm. I am unapologetically speaking to men mm -hmm. because men are fathers mm -hmm. or men can become fathers. Mm -hmm. So whether it's, you know, a kid who doesn't have kids yet and he's thinking about it, whether it's a dude who's gone wayward from his fatherhood, whether it's a dude who's doing well in his fatherhood, you know what I mean? It's, it's for everybody um, in any family structure, you know, because it's not about, you know, traditional is traditional is what you make it mm -hmm. you know but if you choose to have a kid that's a lifelong commitment right you know and cats don't they really don't think about that and you know anything can happen you know like my oldest daughter she's 19 you know she just lost her mom right you know what i mean to cancer shit you know, god rest her soul but that's something that i would have never in a million years factored in as a possibility because you're just thinking we live in and we gonna live forever and right. But as a father, I'm I now am dealing with that right with my daughter and how to like coddle, help her and, and comfort her. All of those things and you because obviously you had a relationship with this woman. That's what I'm saying. So like when cats are that's a grown up shit. This is a grown up shit. And when cats are you know you know choosing to be with choosing to have a child with the woman, it's like yo you gotta factor in a lot of things. Um, one one of the the things that you talked about, like that, I was like, yeah, ain't fucking, this is heavy shit, is, is you know, and I and I really think you know it's a good read, and I'm saying easy read because I want to encourage people to read it, and not to say that it's not very well written, Thank but it, I think it's good to say it's an easy read because we're so we're so fucked up, ADD'd out. I know I am on my phone. Yeah. Like that shit did something to my brain. Like I think I've tweaked something with, with, with my brain. <laughs> right. My my attention is like fucked up. Um. <laughs> You 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 talk about like seeing. I think it's after higher learning or maybe juice. Mm -hmm. You talk about seeing your father. Oh yeah, after juice. I respect and, and admire that you were so open and honest. And I really think that you know this book could have an impact. And and you know like like I said, you know like you're an icon. I know you're like what are you talking about. You know like it's, you know whatever. But like your roles and the the body of work and the kind of roles that you played and the fact that. Fans have gotten to watch you. Obviously, they they caught you at twenty twenty one, but like have gotten to watch you grow up and right. grow up in your characters. Right. You know, and you play you play fathers now. You play you know you're a parent now. Like you're no longer the kid. Right. You know, you'd be you'd be the Lawrence Fishburne character. Right. <laughs> and and you know, like you'd be the professor and shit. So I just want to say, like, uh, I'm just such a fan. You know, and I know we're friends yeah. and and Thank contemporaries you, that I'm, I'm impressed by the book. Um, I'm always happy to see you do your thing. I appreciate you, brother, and I, I love I, I love what you're doing. I, I love what it. you're doing because it it's just you. It's genuine, and it's like you know to take these 
new uh, avenues. Right. And make something of them. Right. You know what I mean? Because we have something to say too. Right. You know, so it's even, you know, in writing a book, people know this is from me to you. This right. This is not, it's this very, not, there's no intermediary. No, and, and you, you release it independently. Yeah, I self-publish. Why did you do that? Like, there must be a sort of, a, a certain amount of pride in that. Because, you know, you could get, oh, I could get a deal here. I could get, you know, yeah. but to, to do this and be like, yo, fuck it, I'm cutting out. You know, like the the this is my book. This is my voice. It's truly your story. Right. There, there, you know, like what inspired you to do that? Well, originally, to be honest with you, originally I wanted to self publish, and then I, you know, we got to listen to the team, and they're like, "Hey, you should take this around town," and and I did, and and I had a deal on the table, which I was very humbled and uh, flattered by, but the business of it didn't make sense to me. And like Jay-Z, I heard Jay-Z say that thing where he was just like, hey, I had to live my life to write Reasonable Doubt. Uh. And I'm like, yeah, I had to live my life to write this book. This is not fiction. This is really what I lived. Right. This is so, not fiction at all. Like yeah, this shit so is firsthand. On the business end, I was just like, and I, they just weren't willing to negotiate because I was like, you know, I can go market myself, guys. Right, like, right, not, right. You're not starting from zero. Right. I get it if you're starting from zero, but right. we're kind of like- Starting halfway. Right. So, um, and they weren't willing to budge. I said, well, I'm going to gamble on me, you know, and, and um, get this out to the people and let it rock from there. You know? it, it's dope. I, I love it. I, you, I, I respect it. And, it's and, really hard, though. It's really, I'm really, I'm sure it's really fucking hard. hard. It's, you know, it, it's it's mobbed up like any sector of businesses. <laughs> the book industry? <laughs> yeah. It's it, what. You know, you can't, you know, you got to let the people decide. Right. And so what what I've been very happy with is thus far, everyone that's read the book is like, this is great. They're right. Like, Bro, this, you know, h- however it hit them, like even speaking to a guy who grew up with his father and all that, it, people are still able to take something away from Absolutely. It, you know, because so it's really very, you feel that. the emotion in it. Yeah. You know, there's times where you're like, you know, like, damn, this is like, this is crazy. Yeah. It's crazy, you know, like to think that. Especially when you have a kid, like to to think that that would be a choice, and and you know that someone would do. Um, and that's the key word, not to cut you off. Is it's about the power of choice. Ultimately, we can always choose to be better. Right. You know. So when people say, "Well, how this, how that," look, you can read every book in the world. You can, you know, you can you can have you know your father or your parent in your life. There's no particular br- blueprint. Once mm-hmm. you have your kid, it's you're making your own mm-hmm. blueprint. Mm-hmm. But all, but before you do that, you have to make the choice. Mm-hmm. So the choice is like you know, there's nothing in the world that would keep me away from my kids. I want to, you know, it's about and it's also about activating, being active in your fatherhood. Because mm-hmm. then I'm in the book. I'm speaking to. We've made leaps and bounds in in the community in terms of you know taking care of kids and stuff like that. But guess what? If you've made something to yourself and you just cutting a check, that mm-hmm. ain't it, that ain't it either. Mm-hmm. You know, that's that's kind of the easy way out too. Mm-hmm. It's about time and effort. Right. Like those those are the invaluable things. You right. Know, your kids are gonna remember the time you spent with them. Right. You know? Um all right. Well I'm gonna ask you one final question. Omar Epps, we did obligatory uh uh top five actors, but you are extremely you're as, you're as almost as accomplished as it could get and you got a lot more to do and all that stuff omar epps top five favorite actors and you if you do six seven eight you could throw them actors in there. actors all right well i gotta i gotta lead with denzel he's ridiculous denzel is ridiculous he's fucking ridiculous right old school de niro bobby d bobby d is nasty nasty even in analyze this, he's fucking nasty. He's nasty. Um, I gotta put Pacino in there too. Old school Pacino is one of my favorite actors of all time. Fucking Al, Dog Day Afternoon. When when you see Al, like like the, the, just from you, because for an actor's perspective, because you know a lot of times I get athletes on here and they talk about Kobe, they talk about Jordan, mm-hmm. and I like to talk to actors the same way. So specifically, Al. When you like, what is it about Al? Like, you know, you're saying dog. Like, what is it about him as an actor that resonates with you? For me, it's it's the the power of his silence. There's there's some there's something that Al Pacino has 
where he's not saying anything and he's saying everything. And I feel like his rhythm, or let me call it a gear shift, you don't see his gear shift and it's kind of uh, scary when they do. He can go to fast gears, slow down. He can, you know what I mean? Whereas like with De Niro, there's a, his poetry, you kind of see the gear shift, you know, like mm-hmm. you can, you can feel, you can kind of, oh, he's going there mm-hmm. and he goes there, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? But um, that's, that's what it is with Pacino, man. Like growing up, I was just like, yo, this dude, his, his acting is just so unique to me and just resonates with me. Um, two more. Two more. I'm going to go Meryl Streep. Uh-huh. Because she's a motherfucker. She's just, you just got to, you know, she's like the Beyonce of acting, if you had to make that analogy. Um, she's really fucking good. She's incredible. She's incredible. Yeah. So you know she got to be, like, I don't know her, I've never met her, but she got to be crazy to be that good. <laughs> Right, I in agree. Real life. I, I agree, and it's not just actresses. I think like artists. When you see that, like you're like, yeah, Van Gogh. Of course, he cut his ear off. Right, James Brown. You know, of course, he wound up with a like. He was nuts. Yeah, he was hearing things like that. If you heard that kind of cacophony in your fucking head, and right, exactly, and you had to get it out, and you like what? It's, and it's gonna like make a- you fucking nuts. Brain, like you see, but but I I, I totally agree <laughs> with that. With and it's not just it's the actors too. Like Brando, yeah. you're like yeah, he was this guy was breaking ground with what he was doing. Right, right. I was thinking about Brando, so I got one more, right? Yeah, one more. No, anybody who you want, I don't care. Or you can even do five or six. I just I love talking. Yeah, you to, can't you can't put a, a no. number. It's just the obligatory like top five. Who's your top five? It's such a stupid question because in art. Like you, you can't, said, yeah, that's what there's it no is. winning. It's it's yeah. who speak. That's what I'm saying. It's who's speaking to you. Right. You know, it's not yo. The Cavs definitely lost to Golden State. Right. It's this person. Like I, when I get asked this question, I say John Turturro because to me Turturro he speaks to dope. me. Yeah, I love him as an actor. I would round out number five. I would. I'm gonna go ahead and put DiCaprio up there. I'm gonna go because the dude is just he's nice, man. Yeah. Leo is nice, and and he's had. Great opportunity. I love the fact that like his opportunities have been so great, but he never fails. I agree. You know, sometimes you see actors and it's like, this is the opportunity, and yeah. they just kind of fall short. He's smart with oh, what he does. Man. And he what I love about like he really commits. Yes. I admire that about him as an actor. Like he, you know, he goes all the way there. So I'm like, yo, that's super dope. We we mentioned Tupac. Is let me one more question. If I threw one like actor at you while you were rocking, mm-hmm. while you're on camera or like in a scene where you were like, this motherfucker is really good. You know, they were just like because where you kind of like it kind of took you out where you just like watched them for a second because you know like we talk about sports like sometimes like players would like I remember being on the court with Kobe and I'm just kind of like oh shit there's Kobe. Right. I've had experiences <laughs> with with actors where I'm like. This motherfucker's like it could just even just be a take. We're like, damn, this motherfucker's good. You, you know? know what's interesting about that is, I haven't had that. Um, the first time I had that was when I was doing House, and it was. I was gonna ask you, and now I'm gonna tell you why because I I I'm so in my zone, like it's like I got blinders on, mm. but I'm present at the same time. Mm-hmm. And the only reason I was able to do that in the house is because it, the format, it was a TV show. It's like, so, so there would be certain scenes where it's just like, I'm over there. And so it's like, I, yeah, I'm, I'm there, but I'm really just watching them. You're chilling. Them, right? You could be fucking with your cuticles and shit. Yeah. And man, it were, there were more than a few times like Hugh Laurie was dope. Yeah. I had a great time working with because he was, he was like, he commits as well. Yeah. You know, I really enjoy that. Like, there were a few times where I'm just like, this dude is dope. Right. <laughs> yeah, he yeah. was, especially in that part, he was fucking, and it was like, what is this? Like his his rhythm. Yeah, his, he had a very it unique was like, rhythm. It was like, what's this fucking guy's story? Yeah, he had a very unique rhythm. and and But I think, I, I obviously, I was on the inside, so I got a, a, a greater appreciation because I know how much he was, like his, he was working on so much to just be able to, you know, deliver that because mm-hmm. he's speaking in a different accent. Mm-hmm. 
he was very concerned with nuances like cadence mm -hmm. of certain words, intonations mm -hmm. of certain because he would say something and he's like, yeah, that's how he sometimes, how do you say that? Mm -hmm. Like, oh, you say it like this. And he was like, yeah, but why are they saying it like that? Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, because that's, you know, they're from the South or mm -hmm. something. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So even that attention to detail um, was was admirable. But yeah, he was nasty. Dope. Yeah. All right. Omar Epps. I urge everybody from fatherless to fatherhood. Guys on Shooter. Fucking guys. You can watch him on like all sorts of repeats on TBS, TNT, every goddamn cable. Omar Epps, I appreciate you rocking me on the podcast. Thank you, brother. And good luck with every single thing else you're doing. Absolutely. Once again, I want to thank Omar Epps for a fantastic I Am Rappaport Stereo podcast interview. Continued success to my man, Miles Jordan. Take me out of here with a smacker. <laughs>